I want to thank Ann Putt for the privilege of playing in the sandbox this morning. Um, a few days ago up at my ranch, I dropped a 50-pound pallet on my shin, and there was about an inch of, literally an inch of blood in my shoe. When it stopped bleeding, the next two days, like a pint of blue clear liquid from the, uh, the swelling uh, went out and walking around kind of squishing and then the pieces of skin were falling off so I finally got off my macho thing and went to the emergency room. <laughs> they, they took good care of me and then they said you need to come back in two days for a follow-up. Well, well, that's not possible. I'm, I'm flying to England on Saturday. They were a little bit horrified and said, no, you need to go home and keep stay in bed and keep your feet up for you know, I said, so <laughs> you'll have to decide at the end of the talk whether you think I should have followed the doctor's orders. <laughs> this were the shins. This is the word of the shins. On the way over here, I was at the breakfast and you know, I ordered uh, 25 pieces of bacon, and 16 sausages, and 12 eggs, and some mushrooms and uh, um, tomatoes. And I said, you want any black porridge or black pudding? I think it would be like pudding, I said, what is that? And they said, pig's blood. I said, oh. So I, I, cancel, I said, cancel the rest of the order, just give me two pints of pig's blood. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel a little bit like a cannibal, but you know, what, what are you going to do? Did you have black food there? Yeah, it's okay. Did you have it? Did you, huh? Did you have the black pudding? No, there's no way. Oh, I'm not going to okay. eat, um, like when I was in Beijing, uh, yeah, testicles yeah. and scorpions and pig's blood and haggis. I just, I figure I'll have so many meals left and for the rest of my life I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. The idea of it, you know, for an American and all this. The fine structure constant. Uh, I'm kind of a novice at this. Probably a lot of you know, have been looking at it longer than I have, but um, that's okay. It's measured in terms of other constants, therefore its fundamental origin remains a profound uh, mystery. One must go out of bounds to obtain a holistic picture. Our understanding of the physical world has progressed from classical to quantum, and now we're on the brink of a third regime of unified field mechanics, according to my view of reality. I'll review that a little bit and discuss some empirical protocols for gaining access to that regime. Uh, when I found this piety equation, it just I just was kind of impressed by its simplicity. And um, so I decided to uh, play with a little bit, with it a little bit. The um, current 2014 code data is 137.035, yada yada. And if one, that's the value in Euclidean space. As you probably know, it's this space, the curvature of space is an open question. And so if one tweaks the value in a non-Euclidean space, one can get precisely 137 for a value of the fine structure, the inverse fine structure constant. And you probably already know this, if it's bigger than it was, we wouldn't be able to distinguish matter from vacuum. Uh, our task to disentangle natural laws would be difficult. Um, the fact that Alpha, this is Max Born speaking, that that is exactly 137 is not chance, but he thinks it's a law of nature. It is clear that the explanation of this number must be the central problem of natural philosophy. Gray said it's obvious from the point of view of life value that the fine structure constant cannot change arbitrarily, or its value very different. Carbon atoms would not be stable, and organic life would be no, would not be possible. The evidence increasing underlies the significance of 137 as an integer at the same time as a mediator for controlling number. Criticism of this piety equation that it doesn't calculate to 137 by the code data is thus easily got around using, uh, using a different uh, space curvature. The standard usage of pi is for Euclidean space. Uh, recent Planck satellite observations were not set for observing flatness of space, but geared for observing the cosmic microwave background radiation spectrum. But the data still applied, did not rule out curvature uh, for a wraparound universe. In Riemann space, pi is smaller, and in Lobachevsky space, 
can be larger. Point being that pi can equal 3 if in and out of space. In cosmology, small fluctuations of lambda and the Planck constant around zero is also possible. It is easy like, to likewise predict similar oscillation for the fine structure constant about a 3 base pi D or zero flatness. It may be possible to predict the curvature of wraparound space uh, based on this pi D value while we wait about 10 years for the Planck satellite to be realigned. Uh, what is pi? Maybe we should uh, use category theory or something. Um, is there any reason as uh, that Eddington and uh, Bohr and Reynolds thought that pi, that uh, fine structure should equal exactly 137? I can only think of one uh, weak reason in that it may have something to do with uh, being able to square the circle in far as uh, the, the way that I might try to speak on this a little bit, the way of higher dimensional um, uh, structures, brain structures, uh, can, you can evolve cyclically. Um, this idea was rejected as by the 1940s when it was shown by the experimental that uh, the value of fine structures is not equal uh, exactly 137. This is uh, the evolving value of, uh, you can see that they did pretty good, and uh, by starting about 2002, it's, we're getting it quite well refined. Uh, a little bit fun on the bottom there, if we, if the Planck satellite gives us some other data and we use unified field theory, if it comes up, it, it could be possible to have a, a precise value of 137. I don't really say that exactly. I'm going to say it's going to oscillate around 137. Uh, but um, this equation, when I first saw it, it just uh, it just made me think about. Um, I know you can't get pi rotations out of this, but it's something about going deeper in in the space. It just it kind of clicked my inspiration into thinking about it in that way. So, for example, if you substitute, uh, I only. Calculated it out, calculated it out this far, but one could, uh, you know, carry it out to as many points as you wanted to have it uh, be be 137 exactly. And so you can see that um, compared to the standard Euclidean value of pi and the pi value value, uh, it's not a it's not a great difference. That's enough small enough difference that you could get a uh, an oscillation. You know, as we see about the, say, for example, a cosmological constant, and this I will mm -hmm. show a little bit about the Planck constant. Uh, all of you should know the Planck constant is not the fine structure constant is not fundamental. Um, it's one of the few numbers in science that cannot be yet predicted theoretically. I think it could become possible by a girdleization into unified field theory. Um, here is to remind us that the fine structure constant is determined in terms of other fundamental constants. This again speaks to we don't know the fundamental origin of the fine structure constant yet. Uh, it's just a little diagram to kind of uh, speak to that, where in terms of uh, the red circle, three space, as far as we've gone, these uh, ways of calculating fine structure um, are limited to three space, but I'm predicting or suggesting that a, a girdleization point is um, somewhere in uh, uh, not the mathematical definition, but the standard philosophical definition. You can't understand anything in terms of itself. You have to go beyond the boundaries. So it's um, so right now the red circle again. That's the that's determining it. Not in, in terms of other things. Not in, it's not uh, fundamental. So you have to realize. It's true that the, the side down. Um, you've got you so you've got the, you know the P's and then you yeah you've got a the circle. I'm I'm just trying. To, I'm just getting in there at the moment. It's just a um, it's a three it's a three or four dimensional. Uh, rendition. You know, in we think of physics currently in in. The standard model is in four space, so this is like a cube, uh, a three space cube with I didn't put a time or anything, but that's you're in the center of 
the, go to, I mean, so this would be the extra dimensions are in, in this diagram downward in, towards the towards the utilization point, which is behind. Um, well, let me let me jump ahead a little bit. Um, well, are, are, aren't you mapping a kind of cognitive space about physics? You're saying the utilization point is outside of of the ken that we normally have about physics, and these other things are within the ken, and you're mapping different constants in relation to that. Yeah, you are mapping space. You're mapping cognitive space of knowledge, right? Well, I mean, it, it's still it's still a theory, you know, and so. But I. Well, I'm just talking about what your slide means. So you don't really mean physical I don't, space for I do. No, know. I do. I do. Physics right now, the standard the standard model is cast in four dimensions, but string theory is my version of string theory is in twelve dimensions, and so I'm going to be talking. I'm talking about the higher dimensional reality beyond this. Standard model, so it's I consider it a physically real space, but well, I, I don't understand why would, why would you put elementary constants at different points in a physical space? This the red it's silly to belabor this, but the the circle and this is just a, a metaphor. This the cir the red circle is just to that's what I said. It's a metaphor. It's a cognitive space. Well, it's a cognitive. It's I don't know. I don't want to agree that it's a cognitive space. It's a it's a metaphor for a real space. And I, you know, to to wrap to bunch them, I can't bunch them all together and have them because then I couldn't have a, a point within the circle to project it to the higher dimensional space. So I just I just simply put them around a, a circle to, to list them. It's you know I made a I made a list. What I was trying to illustrate is a list of. Finding the fine structure constant in terms of other constants, and I, I, okay. I made a, instead of a, I wouldn't. I wanted to also show a, a path to additional dimensions, and I couldn't. I didn't see how I could do that with a line or a Venn diagram or something. So I just arbitrarily listed them as a circle in this cube with a point in the middle, which is my virtualization well, point in higher dimensional space. You just shouldn't take it too literally. Well, obviously. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Not obvious. <laughs> 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 it's obvious is that your finger doesn't change. It. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wear glasses. I can't focus on. <laughs> um, we've kind of said this. Maybe let's see if anything else. Uh, currently, and the standard model is defined confined to a zero-dimensional singularity or fermionic point particle. I suggest that that's just a, a construct of doing the math. It's not physically real. String theory proposes a one-dimensional vibrating extension of this fundamental object. N theory introduces n-dimensional brains. You assume physicality for N theory. An electron fundamental fermion can be a 60 or 9-dimensional nine, nine object with additional degrees of freedom in the form of unified field mechanics the broadly bone symmetry and guiding control factors totaling a 12-dimensional hidden reality from our built that we don't see yet. And again, I propose that the fundamental base of the fine structure constant could be discovered within this additional dimensionality of the unified field mechanics. Um, the anthropic principle is correlates with the fine structure constant as you Sure, you know that uh, stable matter and life as intelligent beings kind of exist, and its bits value are very much different. If alpha, if alpha were to change by 4%, stellar fusion could not produce carbon, so carbon based life would be impossible. Of course, we could be hydrogen dealing, and then we'd be just, I'm almost a big hydrogen gas bag myself already, so maybe it's that kind of life is possible. I don't know. Um, uh, uh, what I want to talk about a little bit is there's some constants that can be allowed to vary simultaneously, not just alpha. And that can, in the higher dimensional spaces, that can be interesting. For example, in the original hadronic form of string theory, string tension was variable. It wasn't fixed, as in the, um, as in the current work that people are doing with strict string theory. And I found also they had they abandoned this partly, I, I, don't, I haven't found a reason why they abandoned a variable 
string tension, but they also abandoned it because it had a, had a uh, tacky on it and they didn't like that. But in terms of, I uh, may not have time to go into that, but I just see a place for tachyon tachyon interactions relating to Kramer's future past, standing away from the present. Um, uh, so, pi, in terms of space curvature, could oscillate minutely around 3. We can have a pi 3, and the main reason I want to do this is something about being able to square the circle so that there is a form of, um, so the possibility that um, you can get a, some gating, some topology that can be opened and then closed. I look at the Planck constant at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters of what might suspect for black hole compactification. It doesn't have another basis in reality. It's just a tool for, the Planck constant is just a tool for doing the mathematics of quantum theory. In the version of M theory that I use with a variable string tension, uh, that ten, that our, the current version of string of Planck constant is an asymptote, asymptote never reached. I should say that string tension is just a factor added to the Planck constant. So with a variable string tension, you can have a, a virtual Planck that oscillates from virtual Planck to the Lamore radius of the hydrogen atom. Uh, I'll try to explain this a little more clearly as we go along. Same with the the um, with lambda, the uh, they can have a, an oscillation. So you have they have an oscillation at the cosmological scale and an oscillation at the fundamental scale. In this model of the multiverse, you have a, a, a universe that's closed and finite in time in terms of the Hubble radius and open and infinite. Uh, beyond that. So this is a non-Big Bang model. If you travel out to the radius of uh, the limit of observation, you would see out and get another limit of observation. Hubble discovered redshift, not a Doppler expansion of the universe with um, uh, extended electromagnetic theory in a direct vacuum. You can have a, a minute photon mass, so you have uh, the redshift is due to the photons coupling to the vacuum over a cosmological distance. All the pillars of the Big Bang, there are alternatives. Some of you, I think, downloaded my paper on gravitational shock waves as a demonstration of quasar luminosity. That's, that's one of them. And uh, in the Holographic and Tropic Multiverse book, if your library doesn't have it, you can get a copy off the Russian site. Uh, enbookfi.org and go through uh, go through some of that some of that work in a slightly earlier versions. Uh, also, especially the using the Eddington Wheeler Dirac large number hypothesis, I was able to derive a single string vacuum, which is a fairly profound uh, uh, occurrence. And I use that, you get uh, the following work by Kafatos, you have um, applying it also to, uh, to all lengths and scales in the universe. You get uh, the Hubble expansion is the sense r dot equals the speed of light. So instead of, if you take that same energy for in expansion, inflation, quintessence, and you can apply it and like having a point in gravitational freefall. And you have like a pin raster going down the bottom, but if the thing is really a higher dimensional hypersphere and it rotates, that point will stay fixed. So you can have, you can have an, there's another alternative there too. This is a major alternative to the Big Bang is that a, a point, uh, we think in the standard model of the plane, scale being the basement of reality is stochastic quantum foam. People like myself and Randall and Sundrum say that behind the uncertainty principle there is infinite, infinite size additional dimensionality. 
and uh, this is this is key to the version of unified field mechanics that I'm trying to develop. Um, so we look at space. Euclidean space is locally flat. We, we the Planck satellite still leaves it open. Uh, Jean Pierre Luminet, I think, wrote a nice book on the wrap around the universe. Uh, and, and, the, and it doesn't have to, the curvature can, can be very small to make it wrap around so that it, it doesn't wrap until you, know, you get up to the Hubble radius. So it's, you know, there's, there's room for this kind of, eventually, you know, for the wrap around the universe, the Einstein even said this, you look far enough far enough out of the space you would see the back of your head. This, is, this wrap around the universe would allow this and uh, Luminet discusses some of that possibility in this work. Uh, here's the obvious uh, rendition of these geometries um, that show the differences in curvature and how the angles uh, add up. Redundancy for the most part here. Um, so you get in uh, in one of these, I guess it's the uh, the Riemann spherical. You can get pi to equal exactly three if you want like that. Uh, the topology of space is open, flat, or closed, and this is discussed in terms of the density the density parameter uh, omega with uh, mass density. Uh, Relativity and the cosmological constant. Uh, okay. Current view of reality. I'm suggesting this kind of higher dimensional multiverse view um, with uh, in the three space with the zero point field. And uh, outside of that, there's a 12 dimensional collabic brain space. And one of the keys is I want to talk about this manifold of uncertainty, which is a barrier between the, the large-scale additional dimensionality. Uh, what's behind the veil of uncertainty? Uh, a broader view of uncertainty, and I, I think this little bit here, partly to Lou for asking me what I meant by a manifold, and I, I found a, a recent thesis by a German student who, who I think everybody thinks of uncertainty the way we do quantum mechanics as uh, the Schrodinger equation on a real line, either x or x, y, z. There are other formats such as the Breitenberger uncertainty on the unit circle or two pi periodic functions. All of these, this fellow generalized to Riemann manifolds such as spheres, projective spaces, flat torian, hyperbolic spaces. So, I feel justified in postulating in this model that uncertainty is a manifold of finite radius. Um, I, until I figure out how to, uh, I have a, a unit thing called a least cosmological unit. Until I figure out how to pack those, I don't know if, um, if this manifold just extends to six dimensions or if it goes up to nine dimensions. I have five dimensions here because the experiment is to look for new spectral lines in hydrogen and as you know when the energy of an electron reaches a certain uh, degree the electron flies off to infinity. So when you get to the point of opening this cavity where you enter the higher, the infinite size, higher dimensions, you won't find another spectral line that will, because the electron will have flown off to infinity. So, if this experiment works, it will be an experimental test for string theory. It will demonstrate the existence of high dimensions, and especially we'll no longer need uh, accelerators, because we'll be able to do low energy tabletop cross sections by uh, resonance. Uh, it seems very difficult to understand how one can switch to, uh, from a big accelerator to something with um, 
that can be achieved with uh, very low energy. This has to do with what physicists in general have ignored, is the Dirac polarized vacuum. The major indicia that a Dirac polarized vacuum exists is especially the Casimir effect. Also the Zeeman effect and the Heronov-Bohm effects and the, uh, the uh, what, what's the other one is not, not important, suggests that there is a Dirac polarized vacuum. So a Dirac polarized vacuum is, is amenable to, um, to electromagnetic uh, manipulation. So, the key, it's very difficult, I'm having the most difficulty um, explaining what I can call a cons continuous state hypothesis. I mentioned that currently we think of the Planck scale as the basement of reality. But the multiverse, the string theorists also are looking for a single compactification that that reduces to the, the standard model. In this continuous state model, you have a compactivation that occurs, occurs continuously, 12, 11, 10, 9 down, and it gets near to zero and it starts up again. It's like a, a rotation of the, of the Riemann sphere. Uh, and it has, um, this rotation also has a, a beat frequency, so that, uh, which allows this uh, continuous state uh, structure to um, to, uh, to rotate, like I tried to explain with the, the pin raster. In the standard model, it goes down to the, the bottom and stops in the amusement park pin raster. But in, in this model, it's a hyperspherical pin raster where the marble is, is also always kept in the center. If you can grasp this metaphor, it's very elegant. It's almost Buddhist uh, metaphor, but um, it's like being in Einstein's elevator, free fall elevator, where all, again, all the energy of inflation, quintessence, etc., is instead, instead used, correlates with this, with this continuous state freefall. Feynman talked about a, a synchronization backbone, another, another view of the same thing. Uh, uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. So, we take, we measure spectral lines in free space. This um, model, the manifold of uncertainty, it's going to open in degrees because of the uncertainty principle, it's closed to us experimentally. So this experiment is going to surmount, it's going to violate the uncertainty principle. And to demonstrate that, it's going to find um, in beyond free space, there are the, the the prediction is that there's additional um, cavities of higher dimension. So uh, they have a volume, which this equation comes from the about 1895. There's a simple uh, calculation of the volumes of higher dimensional hypersphere. Uh, so we can. This is a primitive. Uh, in terms of the uh, actual volume properly, but it would at least give a kind of an order of magnitude approximation. So the, um, the reason for these higher dimensional cavities is somewhat esoteric. The, uh, it has to do with an anthropic principle. Perhaps we live in time in three space, but uh, in Bohmian terms, I can say the, um, the from the, on, the, the there's an ontological property, not a phenomenological property, to the unified field, which is atemporal, and and so that that is the nature uh, of the unified field in, in this model, and the, that unified field, uh, not the current um, cognitive model that uh, the brain is a computer but a Cartesian one where you need a life principle to animate the existence. So that animation has to come, come into living systems in free space like, like a holophobe, like a, like a lighthouse. It can't, it can't, if it came in if the atemporal aspects 
were open continuously, we wouldn't, we would, we would, theologically, we'd see the face of God. We wouldn't, we wouldn't, we would no longer reside in free space. We would, we would, um, we would see the higher dimensions. So the, the other thing, starting with Kluzer Klein theory, they, they postulated that the fifth dimension, if it existed, because we don't see it, is curled up the Planck scale. There's a, I use an alternative, uh, we don't see it not because it's curled up the Planck scale, but you can imagine a subtractive interferometry so that um, it subtracts out, um, you know, for example, there's two types of screen animation. A little figure can be walking in the center of the screen and in the background is going where the, the figure walks off the screen and reappears. You call that a form of subtractive interferometry. As soon as you get to the point of seeing the additional dimensions, we're, we're, we're in time, it's subtracted out and it starts over again. So our, from, from our view of reality, we don't, we don't see that. So what I'm trying to say is there's, a, there's an inherent gating mechanism blocked by the uncertainty principle that, that we can't see in our current use of four-dimensional quantum mechanics. But behind this manifold of uncertainty, with a beat frequency, the gate opens, the entropic principle comes in, and it can't be a trivial gate. So um, it, uh, there's more, it's not just one, it's not just the first, the fourth dimensional cavity that, that if you get by that one, you get entry into the higher dimensions. But it ha will have a minimum of, uh, of five or six in order for it to work, and, uh, and this ties in this threefold symmetry, which is so uh, important in in, um, in in science. But anyway, to try to re review that, so when the first cavity opens, it will be a be this additional four-dimensional factor that adds to the to the volume. We if we took our more this. These are, Vigier called these tight bound states below the lowest Bohr orbit. Uh, I, you know, it seems like nonsense, it always seemed like nonsense to me that there'd be something below the lowest Bohr orbit. But I'd already had my continuous state cosmology, so then I, I said, wow, this, this is actually un unbelievably interesting because when the gate is open, that volume is a, is a little different size. Uh, a bigger size than the, the three-dimensional volume that we do our, our uh, spectral analysis in. So, as you may know, the first Bohr orbit is a half an angstrom, and the next one is a two angstroms. So, I'm going to be able to predict some place between half an angstrom and two angstroms. There'll be these additional spectral lines. So, it's a, it's kind of an oxymoron because they're not they're below the lowest Bohr orbit, so they're not really here where we would look think to look for them. The last hundred years or two, we've We've measured, there's no spectral lines between, in the, in the standard model, between the half an angstrom and two angstroms. But in this model of violating the uncertainty principle, when the cavity is open, there's, there's going to be more spectral lines. If, it's, if the manifold of uncertainty is only three dimensions, three dimensions more, when you try to find the spectral line for the sixth dimension, that's when the signal will not come back but it, it will be degenerate and your signal will escape to infinity. So there will at least be two new spectral lines. This is what the experiment will, uh, will demonstrate. The first one is going to be relatively easy to find, but uh, the next one, especially if, there, if it goes up to nine dimensions, those are going to be much more difficult and I predict it's going to need some kind of a Bessel function or something to align the um, because just the slightest little wrong amount of energy in the resonance will, the uncertainty principle will apply all the way up this ladder, this dimensional ladder. So and it's there for a reason uh, to keep this, keep our reality together. This. Um, uh, I, I guess uh, I'm not getting kicked out anymore for making a theological comment. So it was, I think it was 1995. I was walking along and I, I heard a voice and it said, "Quantum mechanical uncertainty is the mystery, even the mystery of God." 
And as, as I said about that metaphorically, we live in time. If this was easy to open, number one, our, our mind power would be, we could, we hurt each other anyway. That's another story about uh, the life, about living systems. But we, we, would, we would see God. We would, you know, we'd look up in the sky and we'd see God, so who is in high dimensions. So we have the uncertainty principle. God can't have his omnis in three dimensions with an uncertainty principle. He's, God's got to live if there is one in a higher dimension. But anyway, this, um, so this gate, this manifold of uncertainty has to be a pretty cool gate to hide God from view and at the same time allow reality to give us the Cartesian life principle. Um, anyway, let's see where we are here on this. Uh, all right, just another metaphor for the um, for those extra cavities that are invisible uh, behind the veil of uncertainty um, beyond the, the proposed supposed zero dimensional point. I didn't. I could take some more time and draw the other two or three parts to that manifold. Well, I've forgotten what MOU is. Manifold of uncertainty. All oh, right, so it's thanks. Both. <laughs> um, maybe this should have been uh, earlier. The, the accepted starting point is to use Kaluza Klein theory rather than um, uh, the more, the less respected uh, view. So if, when we write up, Peter suggested back in Baltimore that when we try to write up our experimental protocol to say we're going to test Kaluza Klein theory instead of uh, the outrageous uh, kind of nomenclature that I have a tendency to use on my own. <laughs> which was? Which, huh? which, which was? Which was, was what? What, what, was, what was it? What, was, what, what were you going to call it? Uh, the, the outrageous terminology that I use? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I don't know, man full of uncertainty. That was outrageous for Lou. I think he's slowly getting used to it, but you know, what do I mean by a manifold? You know, you can't, I can't argue with a topologist and a not theorist, but you know, <laughs> I think manifold, who's, who's going to even, you know, who's going to take me up on that? But anyway, but that's just, um, well, I don't know, it's attractive in deferometry, continuous state, you know, all, all these different. Um, you know, uh, the comment about your manifold of uncertainty, I, I don't know if this is uh, in the direction of the definition, but it might be. When you talk about the uncertainty principle, think of two variables. It's delta P, delta Q, greater than or equal to H bar, right? right. Yeah. Um, so in phase space, you could look at the points PQ, such that P times Q is greater than or equal to H bar, yeah. or greater than H bar. And uh, that's a sub-manifold or a sub-variety of, yeah. of the phase space. So I think that what you're talking about when you talk about a manifold of uncertainty is some, some sub-variety of phase space like that, generalized. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that, and he, he claims in his thesis that he was the first one to talk about uncertainty on using a Riemann sphere. So, we, so I'm, I'm going to use my manifold as a Riemann sphere, uh, which connects to a Euclidean space. And well, uses, my problem with with my definition, which might not be for you, is that if if the delta p is small, the delta q is large, right? So so it, it isn't bounded. Well, the, the, you know the numbers that come in the uncertainty principle are not bounded. One could be very small, the other could be very large, yeah. so on, right? Um, so it doesn't look like a sphere. Does it? Well. What so? You, but do you are you not doing that on the manifold? Are you doing that on the uh, like right. uh, inside okay. of space, face space, which is a manifold? Okay. So, so, yeah. so manifold. Well, the other the other problem is, as as you can see, I don't have much rigor here yet. This is a paradigm shift, and um, I think it was Freeman Dyson or somebody who said even the discoverer of the theory will hardly understand it himself. I can't. Until I can get all the parameters organized a little better, I can't approach rigor. So, I mean, that's why when I said manifold, you know, I can yeah. 
Well, I, I would be very loath to, to, you know, yeah. choose a definition of my own and then say you're wrong because it doesn't meet my definition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ridiculous. Well, but I think any definition of the uncertainty principle could, we could make, it could, we make correspondence, whether, whether then it's the one I want to use to embed in the experimental protocol, that's, that's another issue. So I'm, I'm looking for, mm -hmm. I want to end up using the one that will align with the, the experimental protocol, but any definition of the uncertainty principle will map into this whole thing because I'm not, I'm not getting rid of quantum theory in, in any way whatsoever. I'm, I'm going on, I'm, as we jump from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. jumping to the, I want to jump to the third regime of unified field mechanics. All I'm saying is it would be desirable to get a definition that would, you know, work so that one could actually yeah. see something fine with it. Yeah, and you know, I, I, you know, I know you, you guys are infinitely busy, but this is not something I can do myself. So I, I hope that at um, some point um, people will get inquisitive enough to help me. Why are you not giving me what? Dark matter, yeah. Well, this, why isn't this working? Oh, so likes to do it small, I think. Let me see now. I uh, ignore the, um, the numbers up the top. I, I didn't have, I got the software, but I, uh, my life has been a mess. I haven't had a chance to use software to create my own uh, model of this, but I, I just want to illustrate uh, a little bit of, I stole this from Kip Thorne, uh, a little bit of what uh, the cavity is opening in this continuous state. Um, so just imagine if behind the, the behind uncertainty you have these cavities opening, it's key that it has a beat frequency or a period, periodicity. These the first thing I came to, I wanted to mount the uncertainty principle. Well, you can't do anything that we do with normal quantum mechanics because you're locked into the uncertainty principle. You have to do something else. So this is part of the something else, and one of the parameters is in this continuous state process that that uh, basement of reality, stochastic Zitterbewegung basement of reality, is, is virtual, and behind it are these infinite size extra dimensions. There has to be in uh, some connection between a time and, a, and an atemporality, et cetera, et cetera. There has to be some opening. This is a main premise of the theory that there's going to be an opening someplace into these extra dimensions, which nobody has noticed before. Nobody has thought about that there's something beyond the Planck scale or that there should be a beat frequency to space time. It, it doesn't exist. So this is a new, a new premise. Uh, that has this type of a thing, and um, and when I get around to it, I'll, I'll make a prettier animation that uh, goes along better with um, from the current slide. So come on, set the current slide. Uh, as I was, I downloaded one of the Lou's papers yesterday, and I've been talking to Lou and. Uh, who I've been seeing lately a little more often than Peter, or I would, uh, I would, I would practice on Peter also. Um, so Peter talked to a lot about mirror symmetry. Uh, Calabi-Yau manifolds uh, are mirror, some considered mirror symmetric. Uh, a, a dual three torus or uh, manifolds in the higher dimensions, and so. What, in terms of Lou's knot theory, the bottom one with the circle is like a shadow. That's, that's the, the quantum mechanical universe that we, it's the resultant of reality. That's our, but what's that, in terms of a live dead cat or something behind the veil of uncertainty, we have these mirror symmetric copies with, with symmetry so that um, this has to be carried up much more, with much more complex types of, uh, knots or topologies to make it um, 
to make the thing work. This is, let's just say the next one is four dimensional, even though it just looks like a, it's a two dimensional image. That um, the I, I spent some time with Peter. I you know it's funny how to get somebody to read something or even to study something, you know anything. I uh, you know I've known Peter since 2000. It wasn't until 2011 or 2012 that I finally decided. Well, I, I guess I'll read his book, and uh, and I started getting into quaternions and. And then I said, well, gee, too bad I wasted a decade where I'm going to be 10 years ahead. You know, and um, because, um, the, you know, the doing this in terms of quaternions is, is as Peter has said, is so much simpler. Um, and what one of the first things in relative to this work that I realized is that um, the original thing that Hamilton did when he added a, a J, the algebra didn't work because it didn't close. And so he added the K and he had a, he had a closed algebra that cycled through, uh, uh, that had cyclicality. But he had to sacrifice commutivity. Um, I visited Peter a couple of years ago and I said, you know, I need to, I need to break the algebra somehow and have it cycle from commutivity to anti-commutivity. So, because if you stay with the closed algebra, you can never get you can never get into the other um, the higher dimensions. You, you're just having you you still have you have the same thing no matter how many uh, pieces you build on top of it, how many extensions you build on top of it. And um, we went to Baltimore, and so then I you know, I kept I had to keep studying Peter's work and his his new. Book uh, is that the what do you call it? Foundations of Foundation of Physical Law. Yeah, Foundations of Physical Law, and I watched all the lectures that are online, which is this is the basis of this book, and then I noticed he mentioned briefly uh, the complex quaternion Clifford algebra, and I thought the conference in Baltimore, and I, I, I got these guys to come out two days early, but we never did any work. We just kind of. So it was kind of, because I, I didn't have the woods but to kind of say, okay, come on, let's get to work. But in the process of reading his book, I realized that a complex quaternion clicker algebra could do the job of, um, because I could, you could have a three or four dimensional lower space and build this Clavio higher dimensional space on top of it. And it could, it could be made to cycle through uh, commutivity and anti-commutivity. Um, Lou at lunch or dinner the other day was doing one of his knot tricks and he, and he put the string on his hands and if he pulled it off the knot would go away. But if he had his uh, Diane take, take hold of them, it would tie into a knot. So this, there's a way to, it won't happen in this first level of, um, of crossings. But with uh, higher dimensional types of crossings, you can get, you can get, and you also, for the long, for a crack, I think a decade, I, I realized from um, Mr. Thorne Wheeler, parallel transport around a closed loop, it didn't return to its origin. There was a deficit angle. So I was looking at something the, uh, the other day, and I, you know, these things are obvious. They're, if there's a one, there's another thing that has a positive angle. So that means you could you could make these crossings up a dimension or down a dimension. So with so my point is that there's enough degrees of freedom in these algebras that I can my assumption is correct make a, using a complex quaternion Clifford algebra make a, make an algebra that will cycle above a base. Uh, three or four space, and you know maybe it should be reversed. That can go, can break when it makes these hand out handovers. I can get, I can get a, a commutative. My beat frequency can also cycle through commutivity and anti-commutivity. So that um, uh, you can. The point being that this 
gate opening and closing to the higher dimension, it's like driving by a graveyard or an orchard. You, there's points where the tree is in the way and you, you see a very finite distance in places where it's open to infinity. So I need the algebra to, to design the experiment to tell how to, then once you get the skeleton of the algebra, wow, the, um, you then can put in the, the spin and charge and things to, um, to make the bend space-time properly so that you get access to the, um, anyway, enough on that. That's, um, uh, so what we're going to get, it's suggested in unified field mechanics, if the three space x, y, z vertex is what we consider of a fermion in, uh, in unified field mechanics, we'll have a, there'll be a lot more to uh, an electron or, or, or something that we will discover. How about photographs? Yeah, this, I forget, I forget where this came from, but it's, it's 50 That's years old. That's a better Besson atom. Oh, okay, yes. Which, which they got by, uh, by uh, meditative visualization, according to them, but I think they copied it from a fellow named Babbitt, who got it by meditative visualization. Yeah, but, but, it, but if you look at the cat's eye nebula from Hubble, you can see that it's vortex structure. It's actually got two of them going in. If you Sure, conformal scale invariant. The point, this is good because, as I talked about, the, the, we don't need accelerators anymore. So if you, if you draw a line down the center and you have your left-right symmetry and you collapse the pieces together to your detector, then you can be able to get a low energy cross-section. Anyway, that's, that's for the future. Um, uh, no time for that. Here's, um, in the standard model, we have a zero-dimensional vertex. It's traditional string theory, we, we add the factor of string tension to the Planck constant. In my model, with variable string tension, which I base on the Stoney because it's electromagnetic instead of Planck's model, you have an oscillating Planck constant from virtual Planck as a compactification continuous state occurs up to the Lamour radius of the hydrogen atom. Um, uh, I'm not getting any time for that. We mentioned these. The Sagan effect was the other one. These, these are best evidence for a Dirac vacuum, which is crucial to being able to do this experiment through some uncertainty. Yada yada. Uh, square and circle pi, extended standard model. Yeah, we Peter mentioned, or Lou mentioned Yang's. Um, um, so, simplistic view of the experiment, NIST, National Institute of Standard Technology, has all the equipment, put some hydrogen in the sample tube, and it's similar to an, an NMR experiment. They'll send in um, one wave that uh, sets up the timing of the resonance, and then we'll send a couple of resonance, which will send in the signal, and if we have a cavity, if we have the timing right, when the cavity opens, then uh, a new spectral line will come into our detector. Need to look at my book for this to see the de new derivation of string tension, uh, which gets the unique vacuum, and then that correlates with finding the um, uh, my least cosmological unit, which I don't know how to pack yet to uh, know if there's six or nine dimensions to the um, uh, basic experiment. There's 14 experiments that uh, based on the first protocol. This is. This is a. This is part of how we the beat we find we have to access the beat frequency. We can't just it's not direct. You start with a, a tunable laser and modulate the shape the electrons. Those that resonance is set up in a manner that that resonance shakes the nucleons. Then assuming there is a beat frequency, then those two resonances will align with the beat frequency of space time. And then our experiment will be in tune with the opening and closing of those cavities in higher dimensions. And so then we, we have calculated, we've done something to um, say we don't get it exactly, we will have a narrow so we can start over here, setting the signal to the dip, and we find the place where it goes so it's, um, uh, it's it won't, you know, if we can't predict it perfectly because we don't uh, understand the the symmetry is perfectly yet, but this is the basic, um, uh, so tier four is the cumulative. Once, once we understand this, you could go, uh, there would be a way of going straight to 
space time once we understand the least cosmic unit without having to go through the, the, the hierarchy quite as um, uh, let's see, just these are just metaphorical equations for the. Um, it also needs. Uh, I'm going to apply. I want to apply the Dirac, the, the Dubois recursive oscillator. The delta t is how big a hole in space time you would punch to let your. You know, photon has a radius, so depending on the photon frequency that you're using. So now I think uh, I can use Wheeler to say that uh, I'm doing exactly the right thing and you guys should follow suit. If I'm, if I'm not the strangest thing that you've seen recently, then you know you haven't been paying attention, so... Uh, anyway, thanks. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Well, we're going to have questions now. Can I have questions? Yeah. Can I do a question? Jeff Jeffrey points out that this has got a remarkable resemblance to Sepp Blatter. <laughs> it comes from the same part of Switzerland. <laughs> he, he doesn't want questions asking, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately that, that doesn't seem to be bent. <laughs> Have a look round the back. Can be a ventriloquist like doing Google. Do we have any questions? Seriously. I'll ask my own question. We've had a few during the talk, but do we have any extra ones at the end? Well, I suppose there's one simple one, and that is when are you planning the first of these experiments? Um, we I found what I believe is the proper algebra that the skeleton of the algebra has to be written and then adding in the spin charge factors to align that with this so that, you know, I'm, you know, I can barely do a junior high school math so I have to either get some money or get some of these guys, experts that we have to help me. Once we do the math, write up a nice experimental protocol that these guys will be satisfied with, you know, they. And you know, Peter suggested don't talk about M theory. Talk about it's it's acceptable in physics to talk about collision Klein theory. The the other thing that's uh, interesting is there's a fellow named Chandler. For ten years, he did work trying to violate the QED in hydrogen using hydrogen, and it was so subtle that it was generally ignored by the physics community. Uh, in 2012, he did an experiment using titanium with one electron, so it was, it was like a huge hydrogen-like atom. The artifact was big enough that people were actually talking about a Nobel Prize. So whether, I know that von Neumann talked about the speed of collapse, so whether that, whether you could see, whether that could be used as an addition for that there are additional cavities, but this, so the timing is right because we're now violating, QED is being routinely violated. So write up a protocol with the algebra that talks about testing kaluza klein theory, saying we can do a better job, we can take the next step from Chandler's experiment. NIST has all the equipment in Washington, D.C. Get in their queue, uh, assuming they accept the proposal. So, you know, I, I think if, you know, if I had a couple hundred thousand dollars to give these, these guys right now, it would still take about three years. But um, this is a paradigm shift. You know, it's not like you're just doing a little refinement, so I, I don't need to apologize for that, but this, I see this as what reality is. So the sooner you can catch up with it, the sooner you're ready to take, you know, there won't be a, we won't be a generation that needs to die off before. Um, uh, Nikki, you have a question. Yeah, I mean, that's what I want to ask that is like fundamentally what, what you're going for. So, um, You've got this, you know, I mean, I really like your bottle thing, this 3D and da 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 So you've got all this other stuff. So you're saying, right, what we experience here in our limited incarnations yeah. is this 3D universe. And then what, you're, what I think you're saying is that there's something then which is all this kind of, this however many dimensions, etc., etc., all this other stuff. Now, you're also talking about 
God. Now, I'm, I'm into God, you know, because I just think, well, obviously, right. you know, I mean, let's face it, huge, amazing, amazingness, right? Now, so I can get that with Peter's thing, you see, he, so he's got, like, no thingness, right? And yeah. this kind of, you know, you can't say anything about it, and then yeah. there's something, you know, so, so as soon as you say anything about it, you have to say nothing, and then yeah. you... you to the, what I can't quite see with you is... is I, do, I do have nothing. This is all adds up to nothing, too. Uh, all right. <laughs> but, um, oh, a five. If you want to, esoterically, I... You know, besides founding Unified Field Mechanics, which is, seems to be the next step, in the forward, in the forward to the last conference, uh, I went through, um, I, I got a, I, I, I didn't make up this theory by myself, and I, I was a little bit ticked at Vigier for this or that reason, so I ignored his paper on tight bound states for 12 years, no interest in it, because first of all, he applied it to uh, cold fusion, which, you know, and then how, how can there be another orbit below the lowest orbit? It doesn't make any sense. So uh, if you read the foreword, which is free, on, free online, you know, I, I got what amounts to a revelation, which gave me this experiment. I looked at Vigier's work and I was dumbfounded because at that time I didn't have, uh, I didn't have the idea of large scale, of these cavities of a manifold of uncertainty that, that you know, and so that, that was just a profound addition to the theory. And, um, and, uh, I forgot what else I was going to say, but it, it, it's just yeah. sitting. Oh, um, dark ages of myth and superstition. The Greeks gave us logic and reason. Logic failed at the time of Galileo. Uh, if you go back and read why the heavier object should fall faster, it is so beautiful you want to believe it even today. And Aristotle, he said, if you're an experiment, you're an idiot. And now we're at the point where, uh, you know, experiments. There's, they say there's some experiments that can't be done. You know, you need a computer the size, the age of the universe to do something. Or, you know, the Big Bang especially. You know, they're, they're to my point of view, they're misinterpreting that data. Hubble discovered redshift, not a Doppler expansion of the universe. So empiricism is failing. The final tool of epistemology is using transcendence. Plato talked about that 2,000 years ago. Your, no matter how great your intelligence or wisdom, a noetic insight came from the universe beyond you. So transcendence is a tool in theory formation. Not that it replaces empiricism, but you have the spokes of a wheel for an experiment. The transcendence tells you the answer is in this direction. And that, that is a profound, so I, I wrote up this experiment in the forward so that if we do get it done, I have a very solid case for showing the completion of epistemology also. So there's some um, unified field mechanics, you know, you can't imagine what, we haven't had an age of discovery for a hundred years. There's, um, you know, solving the mind-body problem, no accelerators, uh, you know, being able to access these extra dimensions, um, I, I believe that a quantum computer, it will, it's really a unified field computer, but once this experiment will be done, one can virtually then guarantee a quantum computer can be built almost immediately because it's, it's like a, a, a phase, the principles you learn, it's just a little phase shift, you, um, you uh, go and do the other. Uh, you can do so many things with it. I think I think we need to uh, wrap up in a minute because yeah. um, we, we need to have a couple of hours to discuss things over lunch. So I think uh, I think we should wrap up now. Yeah. So, okay. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you.